Hello gardeners, thank you for joining us on Mid-American Gardener. We're gonna have a great time talking about plants, diseases, who knows what. We're gonna have a great time. So thanks for joining us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois. So if you have questions about cut flowers and perennials, landscaping, etc., I'll take care of those questions. But we have three really intelligent people next to me and they're <laughs> going to introduce themselves and their expertise and then we'll start right in with uh, viewer emails. So I'm gonna start first with Bill Erickson. Hi Bill. Hi there. Yeah, my name is Bill Erickson. I'm a landscape architect uh, with Prairie View Landscaping Company here in Champaign. And I specialize mainly in uh, residential landscaping and uh, anything to do with your, your yard. Uh, I'd be happy to try to answer that type of question. And uh, I brought uh, an example of a, one of the new hydrangeas with me here tonight. And uh, this is a quick fire hydrangea. It's one of the new sun tolerant hydrangeas. Uh, and uh, it's a beautiful plant. It's gonna provide you with all kinds of interest through the season. The flowers come out white in the spring and they come out a little bit earlier than most hydrangeas, which is another bonus. Mm -hmm. And then the plant turns a, a pink color in the summer and, and even into a deep pink, almost a red color as it gets uh, toward fall. Uh, this is a plant that'll get six to eight feet tall and it has a nice upright growth habit. It likes an organic soil with, a good, uh, with good drainage, but it, it does need moisture. And uh, it's just a, a very exciting plant to, to introduce into the landscape. We were excited about sun tolerant. Right. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. And earlier, I yeah. didn't know that. There's a lot more that can be done now with hydrangeas. So we encourage Sun Bill shade. to bring his uh, plant and be right next to it all through the show. Right. <laughs> it looks really good. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that. That's a good looking exactly. plant. Okay, let's go next to you, Kelly Alsup. Hi, I am Kelly Alsup and I am a horticulture educator for University of Illinois Extension and I serve Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. Uh, what I love talking about most are garden pests, beneficial insects, pollinators, but I'm an overall general horticulturist. I can talk mm -hmm. about gardening with vegetables. And um, my show and tell for today is I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, milkweed and monarchs, because just recently we're having in the last 10 years, a dramatic decrease in monarch butterflies. And really, all it is really linked to is planting more uh, milkweed in our gardens. And these can actually be very ornamental and lovely in the landscape. And so what I have, what I'm showing you is a swamp milkweed, a common milkweed, a, a butterfly weed. And then you look at this picture right here, and this is a milkweed beetle. And so when you look at it, go to a milkweed plant, it can be, uh, be home for a host of so many different kinds of insects. And then there was this book called Milkweed Monarchs and More, and it uh, describes some of these insects on the milkweed plants. So I would encourage you to go to your garden centers to plant these milkweed plants because the larva of the monarch can only survive on this species of plants. And if we want the monarchs to be around and come to Illinois, we want to plant these in our garden. And they can be very easy to plant and fun. And if you can't go to your uh, local garden center to ask for these plants, some uh, garden centers sell a lot of native plants, right, Diane? Um, I've got beautiful butterfly weed this year, and some of them I started from seed, mm -hmm. just collecting from plants, of my own mm -hmm. plants from the year before. And it's a beautiful Illini orange, or, or just orange. Mm -hmm. It's really a beautiful orange. And the seeds can be easily collected mm -hmm. in the fall, mm -hmm. and you can share with your uh, neighbors and your gardening friends just uh, when it's when you can go over to that seed pod and you uh, squeeze it and it pops open, it's ready to harvest. Okay, well thank you Kelly thank very you. much. All right, we're gonna go to the person next to me, Dr. Don, Dr. Don White. Hello, I'm Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology at the University of Illinois. And I taught introductory plant pathology to a number of undergraduates. Yes, you did. And I uh, also taught a course in diseases of field crops and of course in diseases of ornamentals and turf grasses. And uh, I'm now a master gardener. I did that just because I didn't want to be bored at home. <laughs> and I have show and tell 
All right, what I've brought along, this is a tomato plant, if you can see it, and get a close-up on it. This is a plant from my garden. I wish it was, not I wish it was somebody else's garden. I'd be excited <laughs> about it. But what happened, I had 21 different varieties of tomatoes, about six or seven plants did started looking funky, weird growth. Normally, I would have thought it was a herbicide like 2,4-D, yes. but there hadn't been 2,4-D sprayed anywhere near this, mm -hmm. and it should have caused symptoms on all of them, and instead, it's just got this one guy, or just got individuals. Mm. So eventually, I figured out it was a tobacco mosaic virus, which is fairly rare on tomatoes. I thought the industry had it under control, and the North Central Di uh, Plant Diagnosis Network even issued a warning on this virus and on one other one. So, I decided I'm going to save this plant for show and tell for this program, which was a mistake. And so I planted new plants. This is one of them. This was a new guy. It was perfectly healthy for a while. And now it's getting all weird growth on top. Oh, wow. Oh, isn't that just beautiful? So, it was too close. And what happens with this virus is all you got to do is rub the leaf. It breaks off leaf hairs, <laughs> virus particles get on your finger, then then you rub it on another plant. Oh, and I just touched it with and, my hands. And you just oh. <laughs> break I'm the leaf hair and you just transmitted the virus to that other plant. And I'm sure what happened is that somebody had some stuff that was diseased. It showed up on mm -hmm. sales racks. You've always got these plant fondlers that want to go touch the leaves and touch the flowers. They all this. feel the same, so don't touch yeah, them. Yeah, but they got to do it anyway. So they just spread it from plant to plant to wow. plant. And I probably didn't help because I was tying them up and doing all this well, kind of stuff. Well, that's true. Well, I'm going to so, wash my hands right after the show and not go into my garden this evening. No, Tobacco it's easy. Uh, it, the virus, virus. Is, this is one of the most easily transmitted of the viruses. Most viruses, you got to have an insect vector or something like that. This one is simple to transmit just by Touch. Mechanical touch. Oh, great. And it's easy to inactivate it because you just wash your hands with soap. Detergent. Your mama told you to do that, didn't you? Yeah, and okay. I'm going to do it right If you away. have plants like this and you're concerned <laughs> about whether or not you have tobacco mosaic or another virus, you can get in touch with the University of Illinois Plant Clinic, and the mm -hmm. plant clinic can give you a positive diagnosis on whether or not you have the virus present. Okay. Wow. I tried really hard not to touch it, and then I did. So, But I will wash you my hands. can't help yourself. I, well, yeah, <laughs> but I'll wash my hands with soap and water. Now, let's go to uh, our next segment, which is Did You Know? Right. Well, we're going to go to the phone lines now, and let's start with line two. And Bob has a question for us about a maple. Hi, Bob. Hello. It's good evening. Thank uh, you. I've got a red crimson maple out in my front yard. It's been there all oh, 25 or 30 years, and all of a sudden, this is this is uh, it's got like a. I woke up one morning. It was like a foamy substance coming out of it. And leaking out of it, and then a couple of days later, it was just gone. It's all dried up now. The substance is, and the maple, how is it? Pardon me? Is the maple fine? Yeah, it seems to be fine. <laughs> okay. Well, you were making ma maple syrup and didn't realize that the, the maple tree can leak a lot of sap, and they, they tap those for uh, to get the juices to make ma maple syrup in the fall. And it's not uncommon to have that happen on a tree. There had been a wound there of some sort. And then it mm -hmm. self-healed. Yeah, it's, it healed over. Huh. Right. Have you noticed any holes in the, the bark of the tree? I really didn't get down and look at it, but I will, in, in the future, I'll get out and take a look at it. But you okay. think that's all it is, is just maple sap leaping out of it, even though it's a red crimson maple? Yes. Right. You, you could check if, to see if it has any uh, bores, because there are bores that, that are... Uh, fine red maple is very tasty. So, okay, because sugar maple is what you usually think of as for the mm -hmm. syrup, but all maples really have the sap yeah. really does run. Well, thank you very much, Bob, for your question. 
And next, let's go to Dawn on line three, and she has a fuchsia question. Hi, Dawn. Hi. Um, I bought a fuchsia oh, about a month ago and l looked through it to make sure it had the tag on it so I'd know how to treat it. And it says it bloomed clear through first frost. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> and I've fed it like it said to, and I've made sure it had water. Um, what am I doing wrong? Should I cut off the ends? Do you pinch back fuchsia? Okay, I'm going to hand this one over to Kelly. Hi. Um, you, you definitely can pinch back fuchsia. It'll actually make it branch and become more bushier. Then you'll have to wait a little bit longer for it to flower. But um, I wonder if maybe it dried down too much or uh, what kind of fertilizer are you using? Uh, miracle Grow. And how often are you fertilizing? Uh, the little tag said every two weeks. That's maybe that's a, hev a little heavy, isn't mm -hmm. it? I, I usually do a liquid feed for my annuals uh, three or four times during a growing season. Um, and maybe she could go, if, of course they want to sell product, but she could go like a quarter of that maybe. Mm -hmm. But still, I, mm -hmm. I don't fertilize, but maybe, like you said, hardly at all. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, maybe uh, look at the roots mm -hmm. um, to see if the roots are healthy. Uh, do you have anything to add? Well, we've had a fuchsia hanging by our, our window here for years. Uh, every year we, we put one out and they dry out very quickly. And so you have to water them quite a bit um, uh, daily. Uh, and a little extra water even doesn't hurt. So, Yeah, so it could be moisture. Right. Over fertilizing would be less flowers. So, so try some tender loving care in mm -hmm. those directions. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Let's move on to line one and it's about worm composting with Peggy. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Diane. Uh, I always look forward to your program. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, I have a worm composting system uh, and I've got some finished uh, worm compost and I wanted to ask whether there's a possibility or probability that there's any pathogens or anything in this compost that would make it uh, not uh, a good idea to use it on, on in house plants. Okay. Um, usually, when compost uh, heats up and starts breaking down, most of those bad bacteria are killed off. And it's actually usually the good bacteria left behind that breaks down that organic matter. I wouldn't, I, the only thing that I would think is that if you added um, a material like that to your house plants, then you might be asking for stuff like fungus gnats. Because oh. a little bit, sometimes too much organic matter in a house plant mix is not the best. I would use it on, I would side dress with my perennials or my vegetables, but I don't know if I would use it on my house plant and bring it inside. Or if you do very, very, yeah, very or, minimal. Or you could do it now while the house plants are outside. Oh, that's and true. Maybe it'll use up all those nutrients by the time you bring it in. But there, you know, that's the beauty of worm composting and composting is you, you heat that up to a point to where all that bad bacteria is killed off. Okay, very good question. Well, let's move on. Another question is on line four about beets, and this is Robin. Hi there, Robin. Hi. Um, I'm growing beets for the first time mm -hmm. in, a bath, in a bathtub, and um, <laughs> on one end I have an, an indeterminate tomato, which is getting enormous. It's a chocolate cherry tomato plant. Mm. And, and it's planted in one end, and I have the beets on the other side. The beets have started to come up, but every time they get about two, three inches tall, something comes along and just eats the leaf part off the stem. I never see any bugs. I even went out in the evening a few times with a flashlight to see if I could catch it then. There's no slime trails from right. plugs. What is eating my 
dig deep. Okay, so Kelly's going to start, and I'll chime in, too. Um, rabbits? Yes, I was going to say, <laughs> what I finally did, Robin, is mine, some years I don't get any beads, and I really like them. I grow Chioja, I grow the touchstone yellow ones, and the ruby clouds, and all kinds. I've netted them now. I have a little support uh, box system, just a couple inches, and I net over them. And I have the most beautiful beet leaves now. In fact, I just harvested some today. So you're going to have to use something mechanical to keep a barrier to keep them away if you don't remove the rabbits. And I can't remove the rabbits. I have little, I have all ages around my house. So I just used a barrier. Now, if anyone wants to talk about rabbits, I don't know <laughs> we should let Dr. Don no. talk about it. But, but if you, you want to. You can't tell me. No. <laughs> but, you know, there could be ways to eliminating rabbits, but I just eliminate them getting to my beets. There's Everybody some deterrents. Yell. There's some uh, you can spray on. I think it's called scram. There's some others. If you keep spraying it on the foliage, it don't, they don't like it. Mm -hmm. But I think netting would be the, about the simplest mm -hmm. thing for you to do. It really mm -hmm. works. I always tell my gardeners when it comes to rabbits and deer, it's exclusion all the way mm -hmm. because yeah. it's just hard to keep them off. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you're going to eat the beet leaves, don't put the, the scram yeah. on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, actually, beet leaves have some of the highest nutrients of, of yeah. any of the, the greens. So They talk about it. Yeah. So you can see why they'd want to eat the leaves because yeah. it's... They're delicious. It's healthy. Mm -hmm. So, But anyway, it's worth growing beets. They taste so good, fresh out of your own garden. Okay, well, we're going to go to a couple uh, back to emails with the panelists. And so let's start with you, Bill. Okay. Well, I've got a question about um, creating raised beds. And... Uh, um, Sue from Hoffman Estates uh, wrote us and, and said she was creating a bed about four feet by five feet and wondering what type of soil mix to use in there. And then she uh, listed what she's been doing and uh, basically it's about 50% uh, topsoil and then 50% compost. And that is an excellent backfill for uh, raised beds. Um, you can use peat moss as a substitute for, for the compost, but uh, a good organic compost uh, one that's been made with uh, green matter, uh, not just with brown leaves, uh, is going to be your best bet uh, for the raised beds. And don't make them any wider than four feet because then you don't have to step in the bed after you've put the soil in it. You don't want to compact that soil. Very good. Okay. And now let's go to you next, Kelly. So uh, once you tell anybody you're a horticulturist, they think you can identify any type of plant. <laughs> Not always true, but I got lucky. I got a picture of a house plant, and it was a plant that, um, that was given to this uh, homeowner. So it is a Chefalera. It is a very common house plant, and she asks what to do with it. And it looks like it could definitely be potted up, but you know what I would do? I would actually cut the tip off and put it in a glass of water and try to grow roots from where uh, the nodes are. And the nodes are where the leaf attaches to the stem. And then start brand new with a nice, beautiful, compact plant. Um, you can tip it out, but it looks like you really only have uh, three or four nodes here that actually have uh, leaves on them. So I don't know if I would want to trim it back too much. Okay. That was right up your alley. Very yeah, good. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Don, what you got? Oh, I have a good one. The question is, I have a lot of yellow foam or mushroom looking stuff growing over the dirt in a pot my, of my philodendron. I remove it, but in a week or so it comes right back. And what you have there is plasmodial slime mold or fuligo septa. It's a myceid. It was classified with fungi, but they booted it out. It should have been booted. And it doesn't have cell walls. It just kind of moves across the surface of the soil like a big old amoeba. <laughs> and it kind of encases uh, bacteria and fungi and nematodes and other fungi, or fungi right. and digests things away. And you usually are only going to find it in nice compost, wet conditions. And if it dries out, then it'll form spores and it goes away. Or if you stir it up a couple times, several times, you can make it dry out and it'll go away. But actually, I think it's kind of a pretty little thing to have as a conversation piece. 
But if she would water her plant and then let it dry, if you, if and you before let it dry, watering it, wouldn't it go away? Well, no, because she put no. water back on it, it hadn't yeah. quite it wouldn't died quite, out. It just, wouldn't be enough. Yeah. So stir it up, or yeah, stir or it talk up. That helps it dry friends. it out, or or it'll eat up all the nutrients eventually. Okay. It might take it a long time, but. Okay. Well, that is a conversation piece. I oh, must. Yeah. I must say. Well, thank you. Now let's go to the uh, Mid American Gardener quiz next. <music> Interesting. Well, let's go to the phone lines, and we're going to start with a lawn question on line five. And uh, Dick is on the line. Hi there. Line five. No. Hi, Dick. No. Mary. Oh, Mary. Well, hi. What hi. is your question? I have a four- or five-year-old Jane Magnolia. It has always been great. This year, it got the buds on it before it bloomed. We got a frost, and the buds never opened. It never got leaves. And I mm -hmm. haven't cut it down because about four foot up, we're getting the leaves on the trunk of the tree, but there's no leaves on any of the branches. And I wonder if the tree could be saved or if I just might as well figure it's a loss. We're all looking at each other. Yeah. Bill, <laughs> do you want to? Wanna... Hard to say. <laughs> wanna... I, I've seen some others that didn't make it. They had no leaves at all. So the, the winter definitely took its toll on, on some of the, the uh, younger magnolias. So. Um, but as to whether it'll come back and look like something, it's it's doubtful. But mm -hmm. if you if you want to hope beyond hope, you can. Yeah, that doesn't sound extremely promising. But you don't lose anything anything from waiting for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right. So okay. Well, let's go to line six, and this is about Colorado blue spruce trees or blue Colorado spruces. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. You're welcome. And I've had a Colorado blue spruce. We planted it about seven years ago. And in that seven-year time, it's only grown about, I'd say, four inches at the most. It grows around, but it never grows in height. I just want to know if I'm not being patient enough or if there's anything I need to do uh, to help it out. May I ask, is it growing in shade? I'm sorry? Is it growing at a shady location? Uh, partially shaded. It's shaded in the afternoon. It's morning light. I mean, that's on the edge of mm -hmm. being okay, but do you think that might be why it's moving out? They don't and not do well in the shade. Yeah. They are a full sun plant. I mean, easily mm -hmm. can Definitely. be a full sun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. a lot of people want them to be smaller and not grow so fast, so maybe yeah. you need to just enjoy having a plant that you're going to have for a long, long time and not outgrow the area. Yeah. But it sounds like it could have more sun. Yeah. It could have a very heavy clay soil around it, too. True. Um, yeah. Can you remember mm -hmm. what the soil was like when it was planted? Um, it was probably a lot of clay. I know we added compost or manure to it whenever we planted it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that can be a problem with real tight clay. The, the uh, root system can't breathe and it traps water like a bathtub, you know, and, it, and just doesn't drain. So there's a lot of challenges with the tree to uh, penetrate that clay soil. Once it does, then it'll start to perk up. So, um, and it's been seven years. So, yeah. is that? But that that can happen, you know, okay. where it takes a long time for a tree to to uh, really break through that barrier and and start to to get into the clay a little more. So if it's otherwise healthy, just growing slow. Maybe once it breaks through, it'll... It could. Or the root system could be twirling around in the real good soil that you made for it there and, mm -hmm. uh, and not <laughs> break through the clay uh, either. So it, it's not a good idea to, to uh, put a lot of really loose, good backfill in a hole. Usually you want to mix about 50% of the original soil in with whatever you're adding so that it kind of forces that root system to go out into the, the surrounding soil. 
Yeah, that that usually I don't mix anything. I mean, mm -hmm. but with right. clay you yeah. probably would. But normally mm -hmm. I don't mix yeah, a don't single to, thing because if you right. you don't need to normally for most of it. So mm -hmm. don't over don't kill your plants with kindness when you're right. when you're planting them. So that would be my guess. Well, what are a few things that we can be doing at this time of the year? This is summer. It can be hot. It can be wet. What what should we be doing? We don't have much time left. So. Well, I definitely say the secret to gardening in an organic matter is uh, scouting your garden and go out mm -hmm. every week and then look at the bottoms of your plants and inspect the leaves, inspect the flowers. I think that's mm -hmm. a good tip to end on. Thank you very much. We want to thank you folks for watching. We will see you next time. Have a great week gardening. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.